2,000 years. Two millennia just to figure out that we on the Earth and our neighboring planets, Saturn and Mars, went around the sun instead of the other way around where they went around us. Two millennia is most or a very big portion of recorded human history. So this is a long time to discover this simple fact in many ways. And so I want you to imagine instead that armed with today's modern sensors, cameras, thermal imaging, laser ranging systems, all of which you can buy on Amazon, have it delivered to you tomorrow, anywhere, anytime, whether you're rich and poor, and that you were to record this phenomena, and within weeks and months, you would be able to discover this very fundamental fact. This is the idea, the main idea of using machine learning with our modern sensors to allow the machine learning itself to process this data and learn these patterns that we see in nature and give us models we can use very quickly. But instead, without computers, without machine learning, the first successful theory of planetary motion was by Claudius Ptolemy in Alexandria, Egypt in 150 AD. The mathematical framework for this, geometry. Not even sophisticated geometry. Do you know what a circle is? That's what you need. So with this construct, Ptolemy was able to give us a theory of planetary motion. So again, let's back this up. The observations, they didn't have sensors. The observations we had were our eyes observing the night sky, observing the planets at night traverse the sky. The mathematics, geometry. At this point in history, 150 AD, it would still take another 150 years out of Alexandria again before we started developing algebra. This was Diophantus. And calculus would not come for another millennia and a half. The computation, probably there was an abacus involved, but with those very simple concepts of geometry and computation, he was able to put his theory together. So let's talk about the result of this theory. The result of the theory is known as the doctrine of the perfect circle, in which you can represent the motion of the planets as circles upon circles. So a large circle orbiting with smaller circles orbiting that. So all you really needed to know was the radius of the circles and what the velocity around those circles were. A very beautiful and elegant theory that was exceptionally accurate. In fact, the church took this on as sort of a doctrine that represented the divine perfection of the creation of God. So amazing with this theory that it took 1,500 years before we were able to replace this theory. At great cost to the antagonists who came to this theory and said, we need to change it, including Giordano Bruno, who was burned at the stake in Rome, at the Campo di Fiori, right in front of, in fact, the University of Washington's Rome Center, where many of our students go study abroad partly because he refused to recant this idea of this new idea of a heliocentric coordinate system in which the planets went around the sun. A contemporary of his, Galileo, just years later was given the choice to either recant or suffer the consequences. He recanted all of it. He denied that in fact we went around, uh, that we ran around the sun, but instead was forced to maintain that uh, the, the Earth-centric system was the correct one, and he was kept in house arrest for the rest of his life. But the truth was out there, and the mathematics was out there, and in this theory would finally succumb to the power of the mathematics of Johannes Kepler. How does this theory get replaced? Well, there's three very important people that advocated for this switch in coordinate systems from an Earth-centric system to a heliocentric system. Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler. Now here's the interesting thing. 
This idea that the planets went around the sun was not new. In fact, it had been proposed by Aristarchus of Samos around the same time as Euclid in Alexandria. So much longer ago, this was an idea that was out there. And in fact, what's interesting about this, all the works of Aristarchus were lost. However, the only reason we know about it is Archimedes thought the idea so preposterous that he wrote about it and said, see what this guy proposed? This is clearly and self-evidently ridiculous. But this is exactly what Copernicus picked up on and started to reconsider. And it was finally put to rest when Kepler derived planetary motion in a new coordinate system in which the sun is the center and the planets go around the sun. 1,500 years to replace this and make this move. Now what's interesting is, once we do this, it is a critical step in scientific discovery because within about 80 years, the most foundational, influential work of all of physics comes and it needed this coordinate system and that is the Principia by Sir Isaac Newton. Newton's fundamental tenet is the development of this new mathematics called calculus in which we can start to express rates of change. And within this context, paired with geometry, it is the foundational language, calculus and geometry, of the scientific revolution. This does not happen until we get the right coordinate system in place. And so we have this amazing success story that took quite a long time. But that's not the end of the story of gravitation. Once we get to the late 1800s, when we get better observations of the night sky, we realize that Newtonian physics doesn't quite explain all the planetary motions. And this led directly to Albert Einstein proposing his theory of general relativity in which space and time is curved and gravitation itself warps local space time. And that's our current understanding of how gravity acts in physical systems. So let's take a step back and consider this scientific, scientific discovery process because it's very important for us to understand how this happened in gravitation if we are going to use machine, learn effectively, machine learning effectively in new scientific arenas. So we started off with this idea of geometry from Euclid, but look at the gap from Euclid to Ptolemy, it's 450 years just to put the circles together into this model. We then have about 1,500 years before we make a change of coordinates from everything going around the Earth, to everything going around the Sun, an 80 year gap, 87 year gap to Newton, and then another 227 years before we get to Einstein. And by the way, that was 108 years ago. And one of the most exciting things that is happening currently in modern science is the launch of the James Webb Telescope. With this telescope, we're actually starting to collect the kind of data we might need to transform our understanding of gravitation. And look at this time history. This is, this is both exciting and a problem. It took more than 2,000 years to get out to solve one fundamental issue, which was gravity. And what we're trying to do now with our modern sensors and technologies is to solve much more complex problems involving multiple forces, not just one, like gravity. And so we have to start understanding this process. And so what we want to do is bring in machine learning tools into the design process. Not only that, we want these tools to be accessible by all people, not just those who are mathematically and computationally sophisticated, we have open source data sets, we have the ability for all of us to have really amazing sensors, we also have a growing community of open source code. So this can be a very equitable scientific discovery and acceleration process. And that's ultimately what we're after, is scientific acceleration. How do we take what we have in this model design and massively accelerate it so we're not waiting around thousands of years before we take advancements in technologies and understanding. So I want to talk about 
What does it mean now then and today to bring machine learning into the scientific discovery process? What I show you here is a picture of a neural network. And the goal of a neural network is, in how it's been so transformative in technologies, is neural networks are a very flexible, functional representation of very complex data. And what neural networks are exceptional at is finding patterns in data and giving simple representations of that. And what we want to do is bring the full power of a neural network to play in our scientific data collection process in order for us to first collect the data, transform it into the right variables where we can build models that are meaningful for us, meaningful for us and actually really engage the corpus of human knowledge. So the picture I show you here shows you a pipeline in which data comes into this neural network. And what it's forced to do is to learn a representation. In this case, the idea is to learn that there is, in fact, a heliocentric coordinate system. And from that, to build a very simple model of the physics within it. We have the technology today to do this kind of scientific discovery. And again, here, we're bringing it back to the gravity problem. But what we really want to do is go much bigger. We want to start thinking about the grand challenge problems of our era. We have self-driving cars. We have robotics. We have still cancer that's all around us. Can we use this to solve cancer? We have climate change that's affecting us uh, across the globe. This is a tool that's going to allow us to accelerate that design process. So in fact, it's already here. We're seeing the emergence of sensors that have, have the capability to give us the kind of data we need to take this next step in scientific discovery. I want to give you two examples that are ready at our doorstep. One is self-driving cars, the other is robotics. They are already empowered by banks of sensors and capable of making intelligent decisions in their environment. Now, one of the things that's interesting about these architectures is that there's zero room for error. Humans make mistakes. If we get in a fender bender, normally we say that was an accident. But a, an autonomous agent has no flexibility there. They have no, uh, and we're still having to deal that with as a society. But imagine what else we can go after at this point. Think about what people are able to do now in measuring brain activity. In neuroscience, we can actually measure it, whole brain activity and thousands of pixels, uh, thousands of neurons simultaneously with behaviors. Can we use this knowledge to help us to develop ways to counteract or solve Parkinson's, dementia, all kinds of neurodegenerative diseases? Can we use this technology to start to unpack and understand all the complex multi-scale biology responsible for the generation of tumors and cancers? Can we take the data streams we have now around climate and start understanding what are the, the genesis of droughts, floods, massive hurricanes? Are there ways for us to start engineering our environment to suppress the worst of the climate change phenomena that we are seeing. We don't have 2,000 years to wait on many of these critical applications, critical scientific areas, but we have the technology now to start to understand these at a much more rapid and accelerated scientific discovery pace. So my belief is this. We have some grand challenges in front of us as a society, and as a culture, and as a world. Our best shot at solving these grand challenge problems is the integration of machine learning tools into the scientific discovery process. It gives us the best shot of understanding. It also gives us the best shot of making and creating the new technologies we need to help solve some of these problems. Isaac Newton once said, 
if I have seen further, is because I have stood on the shoulder of giants. Machine learning is the giant whose shoulder we, we, we will be standing on in this next generation. So let's not wait another 2,000 years. <laughs>